Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Amen. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today as we worship Jesus on this Palm Sunday. Um, and thank you to everybody watching from home. I know we've got a lot of folks on spring break traveling this week. Um, and just pray that they are safe, that they're having fun. Uh, but thank you for, for coming and joining us today. Uh, before we get started, we're going to go ahead and pray. And then we'll, uh, we'll get right into it this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you uh, for your faithfulness. We thank you for the opportunity to gather and worship you and give you praise. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, as we celebrate and remember uh, his proclamation as king, God, we just, uh, we just ask you to lead us through this time as we set you and your son up as king of our hearts, Lord. And we just ask you to lead us through this time of worship, open our hearts, convict us, encourage us, build us up by your word, your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry. I wanted to start this morning with Psalm 24, starting at verse 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, and he is worthy of our praise. Today we're going to lift our voices up to him. We're going to proclaim him king and Lord, and we're going to give him the praise due his name. So let's rise and give him some praise.
You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Praise God. He is glorious. There is no other name. No other name other than the name of Jesus. Let's give him praise today. Let's remember. Let's set him up as king of our hearts. Amen. Yeah. Okay. 
Praise the holy name of Jesus. You know, I had a thought as I was preparing last evening and this morning, and uh, I was reading Psalm 118 um, and going over the scriptures that point to what Jesus did on Palm Sunday as they proclaimed him king and cried out for blessing. And at that moment, they wanted a king. Just like they wanted a king back in the early days of Israel. They wanted a king. They wanted somebody to save them from their personal political distress, from their, from their lives as they were. But they failed to set him up as the king of their hearts. And just shortly after, the same people who were praising him were crucifying him. So the most important thing we can ask ourselves is we know that Jesus is king of the universe, but is he the king of our hearts? And if you don't know Jesus as the king of your heart today, You've come to the right place because you're surrounded by people who want to tell you about Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. So please reach out and ask us because that's why we're here. Amen? All right. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, because you are good, good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song cause you are good 
God is holding on when the night is holding on to me. God is holding on. All right, you can be seated. Remind you of a couple things as we get started. A Friday, Good Friday, we'll have a service here at 7 o'clock, so please plan on being back for that. Then on April 7th, if you're uh, new to the congregation or if you, even if you've been around a while and still would like more information, we're having a discovery class on April 7th, and we'll do that right after the service, and we'll, have, we'll provide lunch. So please plan on being a part of that and learn a little bit more about and all the behind-the-scenes things here at West Lafayette Christian Church. The Apostle Paul, in the fourth chapter of his first letter to the Thessalonians, now provides these young believers with teaching on, on a subject that may have come to his attention after he debriefed Timothy following his visit recently with this fledgling church. The apostle has hinted around it several times already at the end of each of the preceding chapters. Now he's going to dive in. You know, today is Palm Sunday when uh, the, the, the Jews welcomed their king into Jerusalem. Paul will now address uh, the coming of the king, the coming of the Lord for his Second Advent. So we're at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The Church of the Thessalonians seems to be facing uh, two issues, a double dilemma. First, the Apostle Paul had only been able to spend a few months with them when he had planted the church the previous year. This is a young church. These are new believers. And even though Paul had done his best to disciple and indoctrinate them during the time he was originally with them, he was not uh, able to thoroughly cover all the subjects he needed to cover or with the depth that he felt they needed. So this could leave some gaps in their theology. This is especially true for the Gentile believers who did not have a lifelong connection with the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. Second, though only months had passed since the founding of this church, we deduce from what Paul says that the church of the Thessalonians had already suffered the loss of some of its members. Death does not take a holiday. Death doesn't go to Florida for spring break. Death is always on the job. And there's no indication that this is due to any persecution that they had experienced. This is just simply natural attrition. It does, however, raise questions in their minds about a couple of areas in which they maybe don't have sufficient or complete understanding regarding death and the coming of the Lord. So they have questions. What's become of our brethren who have died? It doesn't seem fair that they're now at a disadvantage. Will they miss out on the coming of the Lord? Now, we're going to deal with the former question, that of death, next week. This week we'll deal with the latter question of the coming of the Lord. Now maybe I should start each sermon the way Paul starts this bit of teaching. 
I would not have you ignorant, brethren. You know, well, you know, that's, that seems to be a little, little brusque, a little, little shocking to start that way, but the, the Thessalonians would not have taken it that way. Uh, Paul simply affirming his intention to fill in the gaps in their, in their understanding in these important areas. In other words, he's now going to teach them. The apostle, here speaking of death, uses the metaphor of sleep. That is a common biblical euphemism for death. Now, we'll examine that more thoroughly next week, along with attending themes of grief, hope, and, of course, resurrection. In short, Paul's intention is to assure these believers that they do not need to be concerned about the fate of their deceased brethren. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with them those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. This is a statement of assurance. If we're right in believing this about Jesus, then even so God will bring with those, those who have fallen asleep. We have that assurance. We don't have to be concerned about our deceased brethren. The reality of the former establishes the assurance of the latter. Now, there were times throughout the Apostle Paul's ministry when, when uh, he would offer his opinion on a subject. And he would always make it clear that, that that's what he was doing. Uh, he could confidently offer those opinions as one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. At other times, he would speak by way of concession, not of commandment. Now, the Apostle wants to make it clear that what he says here, he says by the word of the Lord. This is not just his opinion, albeit the opinion of a trustworthy apostle. This is not a concession. This is from the Lord himself. Now again, next week, we'll look more directly at the status of the dead in Christ. It's sufficient now to say that as Paul will inform their fellow Macedonians in Philippi, the dead in Christ are now with Christ. Wherever Christ is, that is where the dead in Christ are. Deceased saints are now secure in the presence of Jesus. God furthermore will see to it that they will accompany the Lord at his coming. At the coming of the Lord, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, Paul says it at the end of chapter 3 as well. Our Lord Jesus comes with all his saints. Then, we who are alive and remain those who are still alive here and now, until the coming of the Lord, will not precede, we're not going to have a head start over those who have fallen asleep. How so? Well, now it gets personal. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. This reflects what the angels had told the disciples at Jesus' ascension. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Your salvation, your eternity is based on that rock-solid reality. The Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now, that being said, a word of caution or perhaps clarification is necessary regarding what it means that the Lord will descend from heaven. You know, many of us have the idea in our heads that, that heaven is, you know, way out there somewhere. Heaven's up there, we're down here. And we think then that Jesus' coming means that he must travel from way out there through space and then down through the atmosphere to get here you know that imagery of clouds in verse 17 you know adds to that idea now it's been more than half a century and it's just hard for me to imagine that anything in my life is more than half a century ago uh, and so the details are fuzzy but the gist is locked in my mind I was uh, probably middle school aged. It was vacation Bible school. My grandmother was the teacher. And she reported to us in the class that astronomers had found out in the northern sky, a, and here's where it gets a little fuzzy, either a cube-shaped void out in space or a cube-shaped object out in space that was moving toward Earth. 
now. It was one or the other. Now, I don't recall if she came out and said whether or not this was the case, but she was certainly suggesting that that was heaven. Out there in space somewhere, and it was headed for earth. Well, it made an impression on me. Now, in the Bible, heaven or heavens is used in one of three ways. It can refer to earth's atmosphere, the sky, the firmament, you know, where the birds fly. It can also refer to the created universe in which we live, you know, outer space beyond earth. It can also refer to what Paul describes as the third heaven. He also identifies it as paradise. This is God's abode. This is God's realm. Now, the heaven Paul mentions here in 1 Thessalonians, the third heaven, is not, it's not a space within our cosmos, despite my grandmother's suggestion that it was. Heaven is God's space. That it's, it's in an, another uncreated dimension, if you will. Now, the word used for the Lord's coming is the word parousia. It means a coming or presence. It's one of the most common words used to describe this event. But there are other terms the New Testament uses to describe this event. Apocalypsis, which is an uncovering or unveiling. It's a revelation. It's actually gives uh, the, the word revelation in the New Testament comes from apocalypse, same word, basically. And then epiphania, which is a shining forth or an appearing. Now, these, these word descriptions or word pictures and unveiling and appearing provide different angles from which to view this same event. Now, many of us remember the good old days when dad would have us go across the living room and adjust the rabbit ears on the TV so we could get a clearer picture. And, and sometimes you had to stand there for a little bit because when you let go and step back, you know, it would go fuzzy again. And, you know, and, and we were all worried about what microwave ovens were going to do to us. I think probably handling those things, you know, becoming the antenna was probably far more problematic. But anyway, these angles may help us adjust our mental picture of the event Paul is describing in 1 Thessalonians. Rather than Jesus traveling through the cosmos to get here, rather than literally descending from heaven, and we were talking about it the other night at the, the college group, uh, you know, that Jesus is using a cloud elevator to have to get back and forth to where he is. Rather than something like that, adjust your mental picture of the coming of the Lord uh, around these words. It's as if there's a great curtain down the middle of reality. And that curtain is separating our space from God's space. So at any point, in any place along the curtain, God the Father is not far away. Jesus, the Son of God, is not far away. It's just they're not uh, presently visible in our dimension, on our side of the curtain. Imagine then the shock and awe if that great curtain is suddenly pulled back and we're able to see what's going on behind the curtain, activity that is actually integrated with our own reality, but we've just not been aware of it. Now we have an example of this from the Old Testament. The king of Syria is waging war against Israel. The prophet Elisha is providing information to the king of Israel about the activity of the king of Syria. And so Israel is able to check all the military maneuvers of, of the Syrians. Well, the king of Syria learns about the prophet's interference in his plans. And so under the cover of darkness, he sends a great army, including horses and chariots, to surround the city of Dothan, and he is going to put this meddling, pesky prophet, to an end. Well, the next morning, Elisha and his servant uh, wake up, and they find that the city is surrounded by the Syrian army. Well, the, the servant goes into hysterics. Oh, master, what are we going to do? Well, Elisha, he's calm, he's cool, he's collected. He says, do not fear for those who are with us, are more than those who are with them. And then he prays to the Lord that he'll open the eyes of his servant. 
And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elisha. The prophet Elisha was able to see beyond the curtain. Now, Paul's describing in the coming of the Lord the unveiling, the appearing of the Lord, as if the curtain is pulled back once and for all, and then, so to speak, Jesus speaks through, and he now joins or unites our space with God's space. Now, this coming, this unveiling, this appearing of the Lord, it's not only personal, it's public. There's nothing secret about this when it goes down. It is visible and audible. Unimaginable Dolby surround sound involving the Lord, an archangel, and God the Father. The Lord himself descends or steps out from behind the curtain, as it were, with a shout. A cry of command or with a commanding shout. Now this is a loud command not issued to him but orders shouted by him. Jesus said it is his voice. And what command is it? It is a command for the dead to come forth or arise. Now his voice is joined by another, the voice of the archangel. An archangel is a chief angel which suggests that he is the most or among the most authoritative and highest of creatures within God's space. Now, we don't know if there's only one archangel or if there may be more. Uh, The book of Daniel seems to suggest that there could be more. But there is only one archangel named in Scripture, Michael. Now, that which seems significant here is that an angel, unidentified as to class or category, and unnamed, drew attention to the first advent by announcing the birth of the Christ child. Here an archangel will assist in drawing attention to the coming of the Lord at his final advent. A third auditory accompaniment, the sound of God's trumpet or the trumpet call of God. Now 1 Corinthians 15 is often identified as a companion or parallel passage to 1 Thessalonians 4. This trumpet of God is identified by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, as the last trumpet. Now, a trumpet blast in the Old Testament served a a number of different purposes. A trumpet blast, among other things, was used to assemble a large group of people. All right, that seems fitting with, with the picture Paul's painting here. It was used to make a public proclamation or announcement. Again, very fitting. It was used to mark the commencement of a sacred event, a holy event. It was used as part of a worship service. It was used to praise God. See, all of these fit with this context. A trumpet was also used prophetically to signal the coming of Jehovah to rescue or deliver his people from oppression. A trumpet blast also announced the year of Jubilee, which was a time of restoration and and liberty. Now, significantly pertinent to our subject at hand, a trumpet blast noted the presence of God. The scene is Mount Sinai following the exodus from Egypt. It came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. A shout or a command, a voice of the archangel, a trumpet blast. Very public. No one will sleep through. No one will miss. No one will mistake or misread this astonishing and public event. The coming of the Lord, this unveiling, this appearing is personal, it's public, and it's powerful. There are two incredible demonstrations of power which now follow. First, the dead in Christ will rise first. Paul, in identifying the trumpet of God as the last trumpet, says, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. The Lord issues the command to come forth 
It is seconded, seconded, if you will, by the archangel. And the trumpet blast signals that the resurrection is to commence. Now, make no mistake about who specifically raises the dead. Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. Okay. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Jesus, three more times in the chapter, says, I will do this. Later in chapter 11, Jesus arrives in Bethany after his friend Lazarus has been dead four days already. And he says to Martha, Jesus' sister, your brother will rise again. Now Martha's response is fascinating. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now where did she get that idea? Well, she, having sat at the master's feet, heard him teach that. And there's something else which Jesus said here that you cannot allow to escape your notice. It answers the question, when will this happen? Jesus says it four times in John 6. Martha, mirroring the master's teaching, says it once. On the last day. Jesus says four times he will raise the dead on the last day. He then goes on to add in chapter 12 that those who reject him, those who do not receive his words will be judged on the last day. So two significant things are happening on the last day. Jesus raises the dead and judgment. Now in regard to the latter, Paul has pointed out in 1 Thessalonians that believers are without blame and rescued from the wrath to come. Judgment poses no threat to believers on the last day. Now this resurrection is bodily. The dead in Christ, their physical bodies for the most part, um, dissolved, degraded, uh, decomposed back uh, to uh, dust, to molecules, and then having, de uh, having dwelt as disembodied spirits with Christ in heaven, God's space. They are, and, and I came across this word, and I'd, I'd seen it before, but it had been a while since I saw it, and I, I love this word, they are resomified. Soma is the Greek word for body. The dead in Christ are resomified. Now, these are not merely restored or reanimated bodies like these to which we are now accustomed perishable, dishonorable, weak, natural, or earthy bodies like the body Lazarus still had when Jesus raised him from the dead. These bodies will be a new creation. These bodies will be fit for the eternal order of things. Paul says that they will be raised imperishable. They will be raised in glory. They will be raised in power. They will be raised a spiritual body. They will be raised to bear the image of the heavenly. And in this, death is swallowed up in victory. And God gives us this victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be further noted, though Paul doesn't say it here, that it's not only the dead in Christ who will rise. Jesus said, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Some to a resurrection of life, others to a resurrection of judgment. Paul, in the passage before us, presents the coming of the Lord only from the perspective of believers, how it impacts the saints, whether they be living or dead. The fate of outsiders, as he described them in verse 12, is not at all addressed in this, in this uh, little portion of Scripture we're looking at. Now, there's a second demonstration of power. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. The word rapture that we often associate with this is a word that is not found anywhere in the New Testament. But we use many words that are not found in the Bible to describe content, uh, understanding, or doctrine that is biblical. Rapture, 
is of Latin derivation, but it is basically the equivalent of caught up in verse 17. It is the physical act of snatching away or taking up. That we who are alive at the coming of the Lord are caught up or raptured with the resurrected believers is predicated upon a powerful transformation. 1 Corinthians 15, once again, helps fill in some of, some of the gaps here. The living in Christ at the time of the Lord's coming will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. This change occurs in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 11 one hundredths of a second. Changed here means to make other than it is. It's to be changed into another of a different kind. This is significant change. The living will undergo a change that is the equivalent of the resomification in resurrection of the dead in Christ. A new creation. Paul says it will be a body imperishable and immortal. Whether it is the resurrection of the dead or the transformation of the living, this will be the redemption of our body. The coming of the Lord, this unveiling, this appearing is personal, public, powerful, and it is permanent. As a result of the coming of the Lord, the dead in Christ resurrected and the living in Christ changed are caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord. And so we shall be with the Lord forever. Now it's certainly not Paul's intention to suggest that we will forever be with the Lord in the clouds. You know, we're not going to be forever floating around on a cloud strumming a harp. You know, that's a very stereotypical image of heaven, and it's absolutely false. Again, we can't let that imagery mess with our, with our minds. Clouds have nothing to do with uh, being with Jesus or enjoying eternity with Jesus. Clouds do, however, play a significant role in the Old Testament imagery surrounding God. In delivering Israel from bondage in Egypt, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might, that they might travel by day and by night. See, all eyes are on the cloud because it's the Lord's presence with them. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as he called upon the name of the Lord. God is present. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. God is pictured as the cloud rider. See, the coming of the Lord is a God thing. Our attention is not drawn to mere clouds, but to the praise of the Almighty for what he is now doing. The result of the coming of the Lord is explicit. All believers on the last day, as Jesus said, meet the Lord, and will be with the Lord, never to be separated from him or from one another. The dead in Christ will suffer no disadvantage at the coming of Christ. They are with the Lord now. They will be with the Lord when he comes. They will undergo resurrection before the living are changed, and they will share the experience of eternity with him. They miss out on nothing. If anyone, in fact, has an advantage... It's not the living, as the Thessalonians may have presumed, but it's the dead who have already been in the Lord's heavenly presence. When he returns and they return with him, they will actually be at the head of the class. They will receive preferential treatment, priority attention. All, whether dead or alive in Christ, will share together in the return of Christ and the eternal fellowship which follows. Therefore, comfort one another with these words we can face death confidently but more importantly we can live life confidently because Jesus has gone before us in life and in death and as we come to the Lord's table and we take up the bread and the cup they point us right back 
to the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood, the giving of his life for each one of us on his cross. And because of him, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's pray. Father, we once again just, we we praise you and we thank you for what Jesus was willing to do for us in coming into this world to give of himself to pay sin's price, to save us from our sins, Father. We just praise you for that, and we look forward to that day when he will come again for us. Whether we be living or dead, to receive resomified bodies, to receive changed bodies, whichever it may be, so that we may be with you forever. Father, we just uh, we thank you for the work you've done in us and the work you will continue to do in us and the work you will do in us forever as we share that joy with you and with one another to the praise of God. Father, we thank you in these next few moments as we come to remember that sacrifice and that death for each one of us, Father, and help us to always remember uh, the, the, uh, the power that that places within us from your Holy Spirit to live lives that reflect you in all that we say and do. And in this uh, season of, of resurrection, Father, help us to be bearers of light and life because of the love that you have poured forth in your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
one we know if we know our word. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Jesus was our example in all things. The resurrection, suffering, the ministry that he led in faithfulness and obedience to the Father. We fix our eyes on him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We behold our Savior. We behold our King. We behold our Lord. Because like John said, he is near. He is worthy. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our obedience. So as we go from here today, let this worship be something that goes with you. Let this praise be something that accompanies you as you go spend time with family, as you go back to your jobs, as you go on your spring break, whatever you have going on. Because Jesus has made a way for us to know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that should just wow us. All right, so let's rise and behold our God.
Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for that gift of praise. God, that we can that we could just lift our voices to you, that you are a God that wants to know us, a God that has called us to yourself, a God that has revealed yourself through your word, that you have given us your spirit, God. Thank you. 
And Father, we thank you for that most blessed gift of your son who made a way for us. And as we proclaim him king, as we prepare to celebrate his resurrection, let these be things, Lord, that we celebrate every day. God, I thank you so much for this church. We thank you for the opportunity to have fellowship and freedom to worship you and praise you. We just ask you to go before us as we leave here and help us to be ambassadors for you in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week.